from Peking University, followed by uh, Dr. Yon Sub Choi, uh, Korea Tech, uh, and the Dr. Po Yang from Peking Universities. So after having uh, three presentations, uh, then we will invite two discussants. One is from uh, Sun Hari. She is the principal social sector specialist from ADB uh, in South Asia Regional Department. And we are also inviting uh, Shin Rom. Uh, she is also working in Central and West Asia uh, Regional Department, uh, working on education sector project. And then we will open up the floor for Q&A. And the view, uh, we will invite Rajesh Pans, uh, uh, Chief of the Education Sector Group of ADB, to, to deliver uh, closing remarks. So this is how uh, today's uh, uh, ADB webinar will be organized. And the, the, this webinar, webinar is building upon the recent ADB publications. Uh, uh, same title of this ADB webinar, Crossing the River by Touching the Stones, an alternative approaches in technical and vocational education and training in the People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea. So oh, yeah, so that's how uh, it is, uh, how, how this ADB webinar is organized. And the, I would like to invite Sun Su, but he's still not here yet. Uh, yeah, I think he's now here in this meeting. Sun Su, can you hear us? Hello, Sun Su. Hi, extremely sorry, I am a bit late. <laughs> yes, uh, I just finished uh, some introductory uh, introduction of this agenda speaker. So, so over to you uh, for the welcome remarks. Thank you, Ryo. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Song Sop Ra, a Chief Sector Officer AADB. I am very pleased to, to welcome all of you to participate in this ADB webinar on Cross the River by Touching the Stone, Alternative Technical and Vocation Education and Training, TBET, Approaches in PRC and Republic of Korea. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many lost jobs and employment rate was particularly used increased in many parts of the world. Some country which are heavily dependent upon foreign skilled workers are struggling to deliver essential services to people, to the people, as their foreign workers return to their home countries. Government have high expectation on Tibet for employment, economic recovery, and even national security. However, Tibet faces challenges such as social stigma, shortage of the competent instructor and lack of the industry partnership in many of the developing country. On the top of the funding gap and the institutional problem. There are so-called international good practices, but most of them are often deeply rooted in their unique cultural and historical context. For example, I have seen many ADB funded Tibet project supporting establishment of, establishment of the Industry Skill Sector Council. The intention is genuine and good to strengthen Tibet industry linkages. But it doesn't necessarily work when industry base is too weak. This Tibet system works in European countries such as Germany, where historical and institutional apprenticeship mechanism exist through guild. But this may not always work in Asia country context. There are many myths in the Tibet and recent ADB publication critically look at this by drawing experience in People's Republic of China and Korea. This webinar aimed to motivate policymakers in Asia to explore different Tibet models and come up with new ways of Tibet delivery that best suit their own country context. Based upon my ADB experiences working on Tibet for last one decade, I thought about seven questions. These are first, sector skill council, second, skill development for the future, 
Third, Tibet policy in economic development. Fourth, PPP. Fifth, industry partnership. Sixth, six, comprehensive qualification framework. Seventh, pathway from the general education to how, the higher education. Three speakers here today, Professor Hawaii, Professor Poyang, and Professor Yongsub Choi worked on these questions and reflected development experience in People's Republic of China and also Korea, Korea. I'm sure you will find it, this webinar interesting. Last but not least, you may wonder why this publication and webinar title is Crossing the River by Touching the Stone. This expression used in People's Republic of China, meaning to say, take one step and look around before taking another. This also represented a scientific method of the work or programmatic attitude toward economic reforms in China. For ADB staff, I hope you can use this finding to have a Tibet policy dialogue with Asian client country in a different way. For Tibet policymaker and practitioner, I expect you to find your own pathway to transform Tibet system to meet current and future demands by referring to international good practice, including alternative Tibet approach in East Asian country. I would like to thank Professor Hawaii, Professor Choi, Professor Poyang, and Mr. Ryotaro for undertaking this pioneering research in this area. I believe their research is only the beginning of the journey. There are a lot we can learn from China and Korea. Thank you for your attention. Over to Mr. Ryotaro. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sunset, uh, for this uh, welcome remarks. And then we will we would like to invite uh, speakers one by one. Uh, first, I would like to invite Professor uh, Huawei. He's the Associate Dean for Teaching, International Cooperation, and Executive Training, and also Associate Professor of Education Policy and Management at the Graduate School of Edu Education, Peking University. He specializes in impact evaluation of education policies in China, and he got PhD in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School in 2007. Prior to joining uh, Peking University, he served as policy specialist and senior policy specialist with UNDP and UNICEF in the US and in Africa for almost seven years. And he's also supporting uh, ADB study visit to China and the other uh, activities related to education and skills development. So over to Professor Dr. Hawaii, please. Uh, please unmute, uh, Huawei. Okay. Uh, yes, thank yes. you, uh, uh, Mr. Hayashi, for your kind introduction. And uh, also thank uh, Mr. Ra for his wisdom and the inspiration he has for this project. Uh, this, as he introduced earlier, this has been, uh, this question has been a uh, uh, brainchild uh, in the back of his mind for, for many years. And we are uh, we are very glad to be able to form a team, uh, Dr. Choi and Dr. Yang together to tackle this uh, and demystify or decipher this myth. So let me share my screen, and hopefully by the end of our uh, presentation, uh, you will uh, find some stones that you can touch upon in your journey or in your pursuit of a functioning technical and vocational system. Right, this is this part of the work was jointly done by me and my student, Connor uh, McChernan. So Tibet has been around for a very long time. In fact, we have come a full circle in terms of Tibet programming in the last 60 years. In the 1960s, early 1960s, Tibet or technical vocational education and training short for Tibet was first touted as the solution or the panacea for lifting Africa out of poverty. Because by training the, the uh, farmers, uh, you, we will be able to raise their productivity and therefore they will get better uh, standards of living. And this idea 
caught the attention of many development institutions at the time. And most of the, the World Bank loans, or 40, 50 percent of the World Bank loans, were given to uh, technical and vocational sector. It, and Tibet was prioritized in policies and programming, not just the, the, the uh, multilateral institutions, but also bilateral uh, donors. But uh, starting in the late 1970s, many econometric studies have shown that uh, Tibet graduates were neither more employable nor earning more salary. And clearly, Africa has not been lifted out of poverty because of the uh, technical and vocational education uh, programming we have put in place. Therefore, technical and vocational education started to lose uh, steam due to the poor returns it generated. And that shift, that sea change, was further accelerated by the education for all movement in the uh, 1990s, and especially culminated in the uh, Millennium Development Goals. And there is a shift towards support to general education. And that tide started to change again in the last 10, uh, 15 years. Because after we, we, um, after we universalize basic education, uh, people start to wonder whether we have prepared this generation of views well for the labor market. And the World Bank Education Strategy paper 2020, which was published in 2011, stated that the challenge is to give these young people appropriate opportunities to learn, but also to equip them with technical and vocational skills that promote employment and entrepreneurship. In the meantime, UNESCO has published the two Tibet report and summoned the third Tibet uh, International or Global Conference on Tibet in 2011. Th this shape, this diagram here shows you the, the changes for World Bank. And you can see in the middle part of this, uh, uh, this uh, period, late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, the green bar, which shows you the support towards World Bank's support towards Tibet sector is very uh, limited, but then they rebounded. And this diagram, which I stole from Sensap and Burgess presentation back in 2016, uh, shows you uh, with a much longer time horizon, uh, which is uh, the trend is much more uh, striking, right? You can see in the 70, early 70s, for, for 72 to 76, all the loans, uh, education related loans for ADB are actually in the Tibet sector. Uh, whereas in the middle part, you see it start to uh, diminish or dwindle. And then there's a re-emergence re of uh, technical vocational education in the last 10 years. And what about the theoretical uh, underpinning? In the 1960, uh, in the 1960, 1962, 1976, and 2011, UNESCO uh, report on uh, Tibet. There is a strong emphasis on utilizing so-called global best practices and adopt that in developing country context. And uh, it also emphasizes a lot about international exchange uh, with the. Re uh, suggesting a very rigid pro uh, process, a street jacket. Uh, things start to change in the 2015 UNESCO recommendation, uh, which gives more consideration about the country's context and encourage alternative Tibet pathways. But again, as you can see in this table, uh, in a report published by UNESCO and the ILO in 2018, they start again uh, emphasizing the building block approach. And it's not, it's not just uh, uh, the UNESCO and IO. Uh, in the process of this study, we also examine the project reports for 29 ADB project. And uh, among them, um, 19 of them uh, at least have one of the five features or seven features that mentioned by uh, SENSAP in the beginning national qualification framework, PPP, labor market information system, sector skill control, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Bilateral donors also tend to favor this uh, one size fit all or best practice approach. On the right hand side of this table, it shows uh, a report written by the consultants for uh, USAID. Uh, and, and you see similar uh, suspects here on huh? national qualification and partnership with the in industries. This is rather uh, striking or strange, given the diverse given the diversity even within the developing countries for uh, in terms of their Tibet system. Busmeyer and Trumpush uh, 2012 study created an influential typology which examines uh, Tibet system across different countries by the firms invest, uh, involvement in, in the Tibet system and the government uh, support to the uh, vocational sector. And uh, you have liberal in the uh, lower left hand side corner, you have the liberal skill formation uh, system, whereby there is very little investment from both the government and the, 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 uh, the firm or the employers. And this was in, exemplified by the US and, and the British model. And, and I was asked by, uh, um, by uh, by ADB to answer this question in the skills forum in 2019. Why wouldn't the private sector be willing to engage in uh, skill development? Because after all, we the Tibet system is producing labor for them, right? Because there is a coordination problem. Firms as uh, Nobel laureate uh, Gary Baker uh, predicts in his theory, human capital theory, Firms would not like to be engaged in general skill training, right? They want to provide firm specific training. And therefore there is a shortage. If government is not also not in, uh, uh, investing, there will be a shortage of, of uh, general skills. Um, well, uh, in the sec uh, sec uh, segmentalist uh, skill formation system, the, the uh, private sector uh, involved uh, is heavily involved, but they only produce firm specific uh, human capital. In the statist uh, uh, skill formation system, the government are involved, but because private sector are left out or, or unwilling to participate, the, the skills the vocational education system provide is not so relevant. And the ideal situation is the so-called collective skill formation uh, regime where, whereas both government and private sector are heavily involved, and uh, we all know, you know, when we talk about Tibet, uh, you can avoid the German dual model. But how do you uh, explain the diversity uh, behind the Tibet system in the developed world? Right? There are different kinds, but our preferred one, after reading the literature, our preferred one is this historical institutionalism. Uh, which says that uh, every country has the unique cultural or historical uh, circumstances that give rise to their education system. And for example, the German dual model dated back to the guild system in the 12th century in Europe. And after the Cultural Revolution, the guild, the support was given, uh, was there for a while, but then with the introduction of free masters, this kind of privilege was rolled back. However, in the late 1900, with the rise of socialism and the need to uh, industrialize Germany, and also uh, with the increasing uh, growing uh, influence of uh, the philosopher and education philosopher, Kirchensteiner, uh, this uh, uh, vocational uh, education system started to emerge in, uh, in Germany. And it was formalized in the early, 19, uh, early uh, 20th century and formalized by the Vocational Training Act. So you see, this is a deliberate political uh, attempt to use the small business movement and to revive, uh, with the revival of the guild to co-opt the uh, social uh, masses and to control the working class. Uh, working class. 
Uh, whereas in in uh, in Britain, it's a different uh, it's a different model. Although they have Jews as well, but it was uh, outlawed or it was rendered uh, powerless very early on. And uh, because the industrial revolution started also earlier in in uh, Britain, and they tend to uh, rely on uh, unskilled labor, child labor, or, or um, to develop their industrial base and, and the attempt to establish some kind of vocational uh, education system started uh, very late in the, six, in the 60s. So I hope this uh, shows you that there are great diversities even among uh, developed countries. But that doesn't stop us attempting to adopt or transplant the dual model to different cultures, right? Uh, not only in uh, developing countries such as Botswana, Indonesia, also in emerging economies, uh, Korea or India, and even in developed world in the US or in, in Britain. And it has failed for different reasons. Uh, Professor Remington and Professor Lewis summarize this in different papers. Um, sometimes it's, it failed because there is institutional match, sometimes because it's, there is a cultural match or it's a sociological match. Sociological, you, you can think of this in, in the US context where people think uh, creating a, a track for uh, Tibet uh, will further widen the racial inequality in the society. Right. Uh, I think John Dewey was very opposed to this at, at that point. Power differential. This is a point that uh, our colleagues uh, Sanwa uh, pointed out the, the other day um, from her own experience. So developing country uh, officials were torn by different donors in, in different directions. Right? They are more powerful because they come with money. Right? So for developing countries, uh, officials, it's very hard to make decisions. OK, so um, what, what can we do? Uh, Professor Luis summarized this nicely in his paper. We could, we cannot do wholesale borrowing, right? But we could have different ways of, of borrowing ideas from others. We could use select, uh, we can pick on certain aspects you know, with the best uh, chance of success in your country. This is called partial borrowing, or you could adapt a new model with a small scale and do it on a trial and error basis. And once you identify, uh, once uh, it's successful, then you start to roll out. Or you can tailor the system to your local circumstances. This is a most likely method for, uh, to incur cultural mismatch. Or you, your transfer is not, or your learning is not literal, but idea-based. You only adapt, adopt the abstract, uh, content or, or uh, ideas and tries to create a model which maintains its, its essence. I think we will see more in Dr. Choi and Dr. Yang's presentation about the Korean case and the Chinese case on how to borrow ideas from other countries. I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Huawei, uh, explaining about the underpinnings of the Tibet systems and how you know oh, good practice can uh, fail in, if it is like a transplanting without any modifications. And the, then uh, from now on, we will ask uh, Dr. Choi and the Professor Poyan to explain about the, the cases in Korea and the China. But the, that doesn't mean like we we will ask uh, you know developing member countries to follow Chinese and the Korean case. I think uh, this Korean case and Chinese case need to be used uh, for, for reference. And as uh, Professor Hawei mentioned, like uh, there are four different ways to borrow uh, this concept and the hope we can think uh, new ways to deliver a uh, Tibet training program. And the, so, so let me uh, introduce uh, Professor, Professor Dr. Choi. Uh, he is currently teaching at the Korea University of Technology and Education, uh, Korea Tech. Uh, before joining Korea Tech, uh, Professor Dr. Choi also has 20 years of working experience at the National Research Institute, including Korea Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training. Uh, we, we often call it as a cribet. Due to his diligence, uh, Professor Dr. Choi was awarded an Industrial Service Medal in 2019. 
uh, Professor Dr. Choi's current research interests are vocational comp uh, competency development policies and employment policies for Ministry of Employment and Labor and the impact of technological changes on employment. Uh, without further ado, over to Professor Dr. Choi. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ro. As introduced, uh, my name is Jung Sok Chang. I'm very, I'm very happy to take a chance to share with you some experiences of Korea uh, through this study. Basically, my job uh, through this study was to answer these questions posed by ADB, that is how to identify skills needs in the absence of sector skills concepts and how to pursue economic development through aggressive skills policies. That is not just a focus on our current demand, but focus on our future demand. And thirdly, how to integrate TV policy within the whole economic development strategy and how to establish effective public-private partnerships and how to promote employer-led training how to set up qualification system without a comprehensive qualification framework, how to establish positive relationship between Tibet and general education, especially when the economic development level is relatively low. So I will, uh, before going into details of my explanation, you can just uh, take a look at, uh, you can take a quick look at the situation of Korea uh, before the beginning of uh, the economic development. That is, Korea was once uh, one of the poorest countries in the world with pre-modern labor market and no possibility of economic growth based on natural resources. But it had uh, emphasized for long on the importance of learning. And so the way of achieving economic growth was only through human resource based one. And actually, through the, uh, throughout the economic development process, skill system has contributed a lot in many aspects, for example, universalization and universalization of primary education and the expansion of secondary and tertiary education and the close alignment of skills development system uh, towards industrial needs. So let me explain, not in the de detail, but let me be brief as the time is very limited about the questions one by one. The question number one, how to identify skills needs in the absence of uh, sector skills concepts? In fact, in the early stages of economic development, most employers in Korea were only interested in low wage and low skilled workers. So it was completely impossible to establish an organization like the SSCs to identify the skills needs through them. So therefore, at the time, the Korean government had to form a working group, several, actually were several working groups of uh, university professors and vocational high school teachers to create Korean vocational training standards, mainly uh, referring to foreign uh, materials or foreign standards. Of course, uh, there were many parts that did not fit the Korean situation. So there were numerous or continuous revisions after then. But in any case, the Korean government at the time could not be prostrate because there was no such institutions as the SSCs. And at the same time, there was no need to start everything from scratch because there were some available resources. So it, it would be a more realistic route to first prepare standards by utilizing various resources to the maximum extent possible, and then monitor and adjust the, adjust the standards based on the uh, concrete situation. And question number two, 
how to pursue economic development through aggressive skills policies, focusing on future skills demand. Here, uh, aggressive policy is a policy that takes into account not only the present, but also the future demand. However, such policy always entails many risks of failure, but of course, inevitable for forward-looking policies. In Korea, uh, the cases of such aggressive policy uh, could be mentioned. Uh, as these two uh, policies, first one is attempts of imposing training obligations to employers in the early 1960s, when the level of economic development was not high. But there was uh, some discussion, internal discussion, about imposing vocational training obligations on employers. But of course, there was a, a strong objections from employers and other ministries. So the vocational training obligations was not actually imposed at the time, but it contributed significantly to the, to the how can I say, the widened consensus about the necessity of companies' investment to vocational training and actual realization of employ, uh, actual realization of uh, overlaid training of employers in the 1970s. Another example is uh, Gumho uh, Technical uh, High School in the early 90s. This school was set up to produce top level skilled workers who are required, needed, demanded in the uh, heavy and chemical industries. So uh, to uh, establish and run uh, this school, a large amount of funds and various kinds of supports were provided. And after then, uh, graduates from this school has shown great uh, achievements, not just in the let's say, global uh, skills Olympics, but also in the, in the actual labor market. So uh, at the time, uh, Kumo Technical High School was considered as a school that only genius could enter. And it has uh, contributed a lot in uh, improving the public perception about the vocational education in uh, Korean uh, people. And question number three, how to integrate people policy within the economic development strategy? In Korea, I believe that such uh, integration was made possible with the combine, combine, combined results of three things. First one is strong will and leadership of top policy maker. And secondly, competent and committed civil servants and effective utilization of external aids, especially professional export, expertise from abroad. One uh, episode of strong will of the uh, top policy maker at the time, the president of the Republic of Korea, is this that is, uh, as the economy, uh, economy growth started. Uh, Ski shortage appeared in the late 90s, and then the President Park Chung hee uh, ordered, the, ordered his cabinet to provide vocational training by utilizing even military uh, facilities, facilities to respond to the urgent shortage of skilled manpower. This urgent order was prepared in a very short uh, period of time, and uh, this order laid the foundation for strengthening the position of a labor administration and perception, improve the perception about the importance of vocational training among our government officials. But of course, uh, such uh, was, was not achieved alone. Uh, by urgent order of the president himself, that uh, effective design and operation of 
such uh, urgent order was made possible through the combination of talented young, young uh, government officials. And also they made good use of various foreign professional advices. So in this regard, it can be said that the situation of Korea at the time was possible, was made possible because its internal and external resources were effectively integrated or utilized. Question number four, how to establish effective public-private partnerships? Uh, since the Korean government has always uh, faced uh, serious financial uh, difficulties in promoting education training policies, it was inevitable to utilize private money, private resources in expanding the education training uh, opportunities in education. Public-private partnership started in the even in the late 1940s and in training, accreditation of private training institutions began in the 1970s. However, also private participation contributed a lot to the expansion of education and training opportunities. The problem of misuse of public money, that is once a private uh, owner established a school, then the government provided some operating cost. But the pro problem was some uh, private owners tend to use, tend to use, misuse the government money. So such a situation can be said to be an um, unavoidable uh, or fundamental dilemma in developing countries. That is, we have to provide some sort of incentives to private sector just to attract them to uh, uh, public-private partnerships. But at the same time, the government must uh, think about uh, appropriate regulations just to prevent from abusing government money. So the challenge is how to find out balance between these incentives and regulation. And number five, how to promote employer-led training. Here, Korea's uh, unique, very unique political and economic situation had a major impact. That is in the Korean government adopted an economic growth strategy centered on the heavy and chemical industry in the early 90s, early 1970s. And as a result, there was a large shortage of manpower needed in these fields. To solve this problem, the government took measures to impose a certain amount of training obligations on companies. Of course, uh, such obligation, obligation put a considerable burden on companies, but the government has pushed it very strongly this was successful because in the process of economic growth, the government provided various kinds of benefits, benefits to companies. And the government said that it is the time for private companies to compensate through the acceptance of this training obligation. So therefore, it is necessary to properly mix carrots and sticks not just at micro level, but also at macro level. Question six, how to manage qualification system without qualification framework? Qualification framework in theory should cover every work occupations and learning programs in a certain society. But actually uh, before the economic development, there were only a few jobs that require uh, special uh, occupation qualifications. So individual uh, qualifications were was managed by several uh, government ministries or departments. However, as the complexity of vocational qualification has increased, 
the need for integrated management has also increased. So uh, as a result, the labor administration first integrated the test of vocational qualifications. And in the 1970s, the National Qualification Act, National Technical Qualification Act was uh, stipulated about the overall legal reorganization of vocational qualification. However, still uh, in Korea, there's no uh, qualification framework that covers all uh, qualifications. Under such a system, the vocational qualifications have the advantage of being flexibly adjust adjusted to a uh, changing uh, labor market. But of course, there was some uh, inevitable cost such as the duplication or what is it, the confusions. So uh, once again, the question is how to keep the balance, these two things, benefits, advantage and disadvantage of a qualification system without comprehensive qualification framework. Of course, in Korea, the benefits was bigger than the disadvantages. And question number seven, how to establish the positive relationship between Tibet and general education? Education training can be, to me, complementary or competitive. That is, uh, extended basic education could be maybe a prerequisite for proper vocational training. If competition for a job occurs between uh, general education graduates and vocational education graduates, competition may appear between general education and vocational education. This such a situation also occurred in Korea. That is, the rapid spread of basic education greatly contributed to the development of vocational training uh, after the 1960s. But as the university education expanded after the uh, 1990s, the labor market conditions of those who graduated from vocational education deteriorated. Of course, such change was because the industrial structure has uh, changed that is towards more uh, knowledge or technology intensive ones. So in this regard, in order to form a virtuous cycle between uh, general education and Tibet, it is necessary to pay close attention not only to the relationship between uh, Tibet and general education, but also the relationship between these two and the actual uh, labor market. But I would say that uh, we are, we Koreans are still struggling in uh, finding, finding out uh, proper uh, relationship between all of them. Okay, that's all. Yeah, thank you very so, much, uh, so. Dr. Choi. Yes, and the, thank you for this rich information. And the, I should have intervened to, to shorten the presentation, but the, because like uh, your questions and answers are so so rich, and the, I'm, I'm sure like uh, these are really relevant for our developing developing member countries. How we can do without sector skills council? How we can incentivize private training providers to to open up new courses? How we can uh, develop uh, new courses in the absence of skills framework is really something that we are scratching our head uh, from, from ADB side as well. And the, I think uh, Korean experience will be very much variable or, or thinking about future skill development project. Uh, then I would like to turn uh, to Professor Dr. Uh, Poyan. Uh, Dr. Poyan is an associate professor with Tenure, uh, chair of the Department of Economics of Education and Administration at the Graduate School of Education. Uh, Peking University. And she's also a research fellow at China Institute of Education Finance Research at uh, Peking University. She serves as the vice president of China Association of Education Finance Research and has been working as consultant for World Bank, ADB, and Port Foundation. Her main teaching and research areas of economics of, is economics of education, education finance, and vocational and technical education reform evaluation. Over to Poyan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share our recent report uh, on 
uh, Tibet education alternative approaches to Tibet education uh, and training in Asian countries. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ha and Dr. Choi uh, already presented, um, there, there have been different approaches to uh, Tibet, especially to the skill shortages in different uh, developing countries. And there have been a long tradition of policy bor uh, borrowing from the uh, develop developing, developed countries to developing countries. Uh, but there have been uh, difficulties in adopting policy uh, borrowing. So today uh, I will focus on Chinese experiences uh, during the past uh, 30 or 40 years, starting from 1980s. Uh, after China moving into accelerated industry uh, industrialization process after the reform and open up policy in late 70s. Uh, so the, the, uh, I will not cover the full range of policy issues, especially uh, the more recent policy changes, but I will focus on the seven questions uh, already uh, laid out very clearly by Dr. Cho in the, in the presentation, in his presentation on Korean experiences. Uh, so before I go, I really want to emphasize again this concept of a national skill formation system, uh, because not only uh, Dr. Ha presented the four models for developing economies, uh, there have also been discussion about the national skill formation system in the uh, Asian countries, especially in uh, uh, East South Asian countries. Um, so the concept of developmental skill formation system have been presented by scholars from the uh, UCL around year 2000, um, they analyzed the uh, uh, technical vocational education systems across uh, different regions and economies in Asian countries. And find, for instance, Singapore and South Korea and, and uh, uh, even Thailand and Japan uh, maybe fall into this idea of, 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 uh, called developmental skill formation system, where you have strong economic uh, ministries coordinating centralized Tibet education system and also industry policies. Uh, so I think in Dr. Choi's presentation, he actually mentioned, you know, the collaboration not only um, among the Tibet sector, but also with uh, economic, in the, uh, e economic ministries. So uh, does China really also fall into this model, especially in the time period we discussed? And also, what, what, you know, uh, what's the unique experiences of China if, if China has actually followed this developmental model? So today, my presentation is really focused on uh, China's unique experiences, even within the East Asian models. Um, so before we go to the detailed uh, response to the seven questions, I want to just outline China's development uh, over the past 30 years or even 70 years regarding policy uh, borrowing in uh, skill formation uh, in terms of Tibet systems. Uh, actually, uh, starting from 1950s, China initiated its first five-year uh, uh, planning starting 1953. So by that time, uh, China already decided to adopting this accelerated uh, industrialization approach uh, following the Soviet Union model. Um, so uh, typically in that particular model was the central planning. Um, so um, there's a strong uh, movement or encouragement of state-owned enterprises to train their own uh, workers. Uh, use apprenticeship or, uh, or the state-owned enterprises initiate their own uh, uh, middle secondary uh, uh, technical schools within the, within the firm site. So there's a very strong firm involvement and also government involvement because all this apprenticeship training was uh, uh, paid or reimbursed by the government. Um, but this is really uh, continue on until the mid 80s. And in the mid 80s until the late 1990s, there's a new uh, a movement uh, of adopting uh, the European model, especially uh, two models, particularly one is the German apprenticeship model. Uh, the other one is really the British national qualification framework. Um, the argument being, you know, um, we should, developing our NQF, we should have a national qualification framework set up, or we should go with this really the workplace uh, based Tibet model rather than uh, go through the school based uh, uh, Tibet model. Uh, but the European model wasn't uh, entirely adopted here in China because of Dr. Harvey already mentioned the institutional differences and historical differences, uh, the cultural differences. So starting 2000, we have been, we have been uh, kind of marching along the, the way for 20 years to find really a the Chinese model of really with a very strong government involvement also bring from back uh, through various of the uh, public and private partnerships. So uh, along the seven questions uh, we discussed today, uh, I want to uh, focus three key messages here. 
So the first messages along, you know, the seven questions, really very strong state initiative. Uh, integrating skill formation with industrial policies in national uh, development strategy and also sector reform agenda. Uh, so this is actually go across three different uh, questions we discussed today um, about the uh, uh, skill planning and also about the uh, the policy integration of the Tibet policy with the national strategy and also about national qualification framework. Here in terms of the skill uh, planning, uh, very importantly um, is really to, to analyze, to have a, this kind of a very strong uh, centralized, uh, a centralized support or centralized uh, encompassing national framework uh, for skill planning with a sexual uh, uh, affiliation, sexual associations. Uh, especially in terms of policy integra integration here, uh, I give the example of two uh, examples here in China is how have this kind of three stages development uh, for integrating Tibet strategy with a national strategy. Uh, first of all, very importantly, you have this kind of, you have to have this kind of top leaders to have the political mobilization at the very top. So here I give the example on the left hand side, uh, 1984, uh, the CPC Central Committee issued the reform on the economic system. So at that time, we already decided to open up have adopted this reform agenda, and, in, and this agenda was quickly uh, translated into the national strategy for education in 1985. One year later, we have this reform agenda really uh, adopting this uh, new economic agenda and put Tibet education, especially secondary level Tibet education, at the forefront for skilled labor training. And then uh, this national strategy is translated into a sexual implementation uh, strategy couple of years later through this National Vocational Education Convention and translated into a particular very specific uh, sector-wide strategy. So this is a policy in integration from the uh, kind of uh, uh, ideology and then translate into policy and then translate into the sector strategy. Um, so the second message I think is very critical is about local ex experimentation. Although you have a state initiative, this is very, very important to bring this state uh, policy agenda into the local level. And also because China was so diverse, the region was so diverse. So the local experimentation was very uh, uh, important or critical for building on and developing these local connections across governments, firms and schools, because this is really critical for, uh, not only for the purposes of implementation, also to adjusting to the various con uh, conditions of the region of the different regions. So here re really refer to the uh, question five and question seven uh, in the report on the Chinese chapter, chapter three. Um, first, of all, first of all, how do we involve uh, local industries back? So the Chinese solution or the China solution to this was regional skill partnerships. So regional skill partnership is now uh, involving my, uh, a very high level government uh, uh, layers of government uh, 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 branches, but rather local. Here I give the example, uh, uh, we can uh, build this kind of typology dividing different uh, region, regional skill partnership into four types, depending on the, the cost of investment put, put aside by different partners and also the scope of collaboration among partners. Uh, here we can see, for instance, on, on, on the right hand side, the parental model where you have a dominant firms uh, at the local level, they, they were like uh, dominant firms and then they working uh, with all the other firms in their supply chain, supply chains and developing this kind of skill partnerships. So the, the dominant firm not only produce their own skilled laborers, but also provided for the, the, the other suppliers in the supply ch chains. But also you also have a consortium model where you, you have a sexual association. This is also local sexual associations. Um, who, who collaborating with the multiple firms to build up this kind of multiple uh, school and firm participated uh, regional skill partnerships. So this is also quite critical. Um, the other side of local experimentation is really about how to integrate uh, vocational and general education. Uh, in China, this is also the challenge because of social stigma. So the secondary vocational education is not very uh, uh, you know, now the top choice from the household. So two way to solve the problem, uh, I call it horizontal and vertical integration. 
So the vertical integration is really to integrate secondary vocational education with a certain types of higher education. It could either be a social degree uh, for vocational education or bachelor degree for vocational education, or even the general uh, bachelor degree programs. Um, so starting from 2014, there have been different kind of local experimentations uh, to adopting this policy into the local scenario, for instance, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, and Suzhou, and other big cities. Uh, there have been a lot of efforts to, to build this kind of vocational uh, pathways. The other way is really horizontal integration, which is to build uh, pilot comprehensive uh, high schools where you have both general and the vocational track. So um, finally, the last message, you know, uh, on top of state initiative and the local ex experimentations, um, to make the things work, uh, you need uh, high quality intermediary, intermediary organizations. Here I give two examples, address question two and four, uh, which is in the first case, uh, to, to have this really effective skill for casting, for future skill needs for casting, you need buffer organizations to organize different partners to work together. Especially without the sector skill council, uh, you need quite diverse kinds of buffer organizations. In Chinese case, in many cases, um, the business association, local business association can become intermediary or even the local uh, government. Uh, for instance, human development branches of local government uh, can become a really effective buffer organizations. So the, the, uh, the high quality intermediary organizations also behind the public and private partnerships. Uh, uh, we give uh, multiple examples in the report, especially uh, in the east eastern coast part of China. For instance, uh, we can see if we can, uh, looking at the public and private partnership in terms of degree of the school form co uh, cooperation and degree of interform cooperation, uh, we can define four different types. Uh, for instance, the government-led coordination model where you have very strong or very high level of school form collaboration, but the degree of interform collaboration was quite low. So when the interform collaboration is, is low, you can have a lot of bilateral collaboration between firms and schools. Now the government can come in and play the role of intermediary, intermediary uh, and then invite multiple forms to participate. Uh, this is a particular case in the Suzhou, uh, in the Jiangsu provinces uh, in China, where you have a lot, a lot of advanced uh, manufacturer factories, especially multinationals, cluster there. And then the government really played this role of intermediary to invite uh, a different party with quite diverse interests to come in together and build up this kind of uh, public and private partnership. So to put the concept into into really a uh, functioning model, working models, uh, we need this type of intermediary to bridge uh, the gap. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, that's my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Boyan, uh, for excellent uh, presentation about the Chinese case studies. And the particularly like this intermediary organization is a very interesting one. I myself uh, managing some Tibet project in Bhutan and also supporting Tibet system in Sri Lanka. We, we often tend to ask, you know, or training public training provider to talk to the industry directly, but they have some teaching obligations and it's very difficult to, to deepen the uh, industry linkage. But having some in intermediary organization may work in other countries setting as well. So this is worth uh, thinking about. Uh, I, I'm sure like uh, other ADB experienced uh, officers have been uh, like a, a good response and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sun Hari She's the principal social sector specialist, and she's uh, working on a uh, Tibet project in India and Bangladesh. And the, over to Sunha, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ryo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to convey uh, great appreciation to Professor uh, Professor Choi, uh, Professor Hawei, and Puyang in developing this excellent work on the institutional history of Tibet development in the Korea and China. Uh, their accounts offered a very uh, important lessons uh, and examples to developing countries at present, uh, especially for those countries looking for many labor market and development solutions uh, in their Tibet or broader skills uh, strategies. 
Uh, let me uh, offer a couple of uh, insights from a uh, practitioner's uh, perspective, uh, since I'm directly working with uh, ADB developing member countries, uh, such as India and Bangladesh. Uh, first, uh, as authors pointed out, uh, there is no one size fits all solution uh, in Tibet. And the DMCs are looking into various models uh, considering their own unique historical, economic, educational, and developing uh, development trajectories. Uh, in fact, uh, our DMCs are presented with uh, uh, various uh, Tibet models and practices uh, which offer both opportunities and challenges. Uh, the key challenge, as I observe, is that there are too many different models and too many different stakeholders, uh, both uh, national and international. Uh, how I briefly mentioned that, uh, you know, there are representatives uh, from Germany, UK, other EU constituencies, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, Korea, uh, and the IRO, and also other development agencies, the UNESCO, the ADB, and the World Bank. And sometimes, you know, it leads to uh, it leads to uh, approaches conflicting with each other. Uh, more importantly, this can lead to very fragmented approach and implementation outcomes, especially when the Tibet ecosystem is very weak and only evolving and industries are not so mature. Uh, however, uh, a good uh, progress is also being made, uh, could be made under certain situations, uh, which are consistent with the two country cases uh, discussed today. Uh, one, uh, when there is a strong leadership, especially in the tight coupling of a national or local development strategies uh, with the Tibet policies and plans, uh, it can uh, foster strong uh, political commitment and uh, garner the broader support uh, with the partnerships among uh, governments, uh, Tibet institutions, industries, and other private sector partners. And uh, I would say this can be illustrated in the, our case in Bangladesh, uh, where human capital investment was a key emphasis in the government development strategy. And the Ministry of Finance took strong leadership uh, in delivering nationwide uh, skills uh, training programs. Uh, still, uh, there are uh, ongoing tensions in the approach toward the qualification framework, training standards, and other quality assurance of procedures uh, among the different ministries in the country. And uh, in this context, I would say uh, highly competent officials, industry leaders, and the TVET experts are very important. Uh, finding a coherent, a coordinated approach and ensuring concerted efforts uh, among the different stakeholders is uh, very important, uh, but uh, this uh, continue to pose uh, serious uh, challenges uh, in today's uh, DMC context. Uh, my uh, a second comment is related to the fact that uh, today's uh, DMCs are looking at not just uh, historical uh, models, of Tibet de development from China or Korea, but also what's happening these days. Uh, as we all know, today's DMCs are confronted with the development process, which is a lot more complicated and integrated uh, globally uh, than the times experienced by Korea and China. A good example is a technology of advances, especially the impact of a disrupted technologies on the businesses and the skill requirements. And uh, this changes in the nature of jobs, along with the types of uh, skills that are also disrupting the country's uh, Tibet uh, development process. And, and uh, there is a growing emphasis on a solid foundational skills uh, or general education background because the, the, the basic skills required for TVET is also going up. Uh, the PRC case just discussed about various vertical and horizontal integrated approaches, uh, while the Korea also has transformed some of its technical high schools. Uh, and I can see that India is already trying uh, such integrated and more uh, flexible models uh, in uh, some of the states already. Uh, 
So uh, I hope uh, we can continue to share the experiences and the different institutional models to other DMCs uh, so that uh, decision makers could take uh, lessons and good practices in, uh, in the Tibet developments double for each country context. Thank you. Over to you, Ryo. Yeah, thank you very much, Sunka, for excellent comments. And the, I will also uh, try to turn to uh, Shinron. Uh, she's the senior social sector specialist working in the Central and the West Asia regions. And her portfolio includes education and skills development, her project in that particular region. So over to uh, Shinron. Thank you very much, Ryotaro. Uh, and uh, first, thanks for uh, Mr. Ra and SBCC to having uh, to have initiated this study and for uh, three professors want to you know, work on that. Um, so um, I have, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, reading, you know, over the study and, uh, you know, I would like to share some of my thoughts and also some comments and even uh, some some ideas, you know, like for further, you know, exploration. Um, so uh, I, I like the idea of this. Uh, I mean, this title, uh, you know, is is I mean, captures exactly the uh, conveys exactly, you know, what the uh, study would like to share with us. So uh, just to to share with all the audience. So uh, the meaning of uh, you know, like um, touching a stone to cross river is an old Chinese proverb. Uh, it means that you know if you would like to cross a river, but there is no a bridge or no boat, how would you do it? Like, would you just wait there to build the uh, bridge and boat first before you can cross it, or you will just try your best, like to you know find if there is any stones that you can rely on firmly to cross it. So, um, so uh, it you know uh, 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 sets you know it. Uh, comes up, you know, with the situation of most of our developing member countries, you know, who are now, you know, trying to build up their um, market relevant skills development system in their countries. Um, so I learned a lot like from the study and presentation that no matter, you know, what um, kind of, what types of, you know, organizations, institutions, or uh, stakeholders participation in the system, the building blocks are there and it's uh, for the state of art of each country like to find out the best way to link this brain uh, you know building blocks so these building blocks are analyzing skills demand proposing competency requirement uh, developing you know curriculum and pedagogy uh, method uh, teacher development uh, and school firm collaboration as well as you know how to balance the academic uh, teaching and qualification, you know, certificate requirements. Um, so we'd like to say that, uh, yeah, uh, my, you know, first of the sorts is, uh, what's, what would the government's role be in this process uh, when a country is at its picking up stage of industry development? So there might not be, you know, like many, um, you know, big or medium scale you know, scale enterprises who have their uh, skilled workforce and who knows what kind of skills they, they would need, you know. So, um, so what the government's role would be, you know, in this process and, and how government is, you know, taking its stake of allowing flexibility. For example, you know, like uh, when uh, I'm processing a, con a project for a country, you know, I'm, I, I encountered a question that, why we have to allow private companies to take advantage of our public property to, you know, for their own benefit. So that was when a private firm in, for example, in textile, you know, uh, uh, industry would like to collaborate with a TVET training, you know, institution, you know, for building up its workforce, right? So, so, so this kind of like government's you know, buying should be at the very uh, beginning, you know, to allow, you know, flexibility and the trial of the firm school collaboration or even at a higher level, you know, uh, collaboration. And uh, secondly is uh, uh, what would be the school's autonomy in this process? 
I can see from China's, you know, uh, experience, you know, uh, you know, the TVET institutions are allowed like to collaborate with uh, firms and use firms, you know, competency requirement and their required, you know, jobs to build their own, uh, you know, training programs and even, you know, use the companies, you know, like uh, assessment requirement, like to assess their students and giving out, you know, certificate. And this practice, it, it has even, you know, more be, you know, um, scaled up to more TVET institutions. Um, very often, you know, in a country where we will need like new technologies, new skills, you know, the, the previous curriculum, previous training program may not predict, right? But if a uh, government does not allow, you know, like enough you know, autonomy for schools to exert their role, in this process, it will be very constrained. For example, in uh, many Central Asian countries, the uh, government may only allow 15%, you know, you know, of the uh, teaching and learning program to be adjusted by the school. So it would not be enough, you know, if a new skill, uh, you know, would, would need, you know, to get, uh, get the schools, you know, to uh, contribute for the training. And then um, I would like to uh, also ask, uh, because I compared the Korea and Chinese cases and um, would like to, uh, and, and noticed, for example, the one difference is in Korea, there is this uh, legal or regula uh, regula uh, uh, regulation on firms to contribute their resources, you know, or, you know, take levies, you know, like for providing trainings. Uh, in China, there is no such, uh, you know, like a legal, you know, a regular, re, uh, regularization on that. Um, but still, you know, in China, like uh, uh, firms are providing their professionals, you know, to join, for example, this, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Yang pointed out, this uh, uh, intermediary organization, and uh, for example, in, in, in many such sectors, like 40% of the members in this uh, intermediary organization or uh, steering committee could be from the uh, enterprises. So I hope to know more that how these uh, professionals from industries are encouraged or incentivized to come and join the workforce, you know, because it really takes their time and energy and all this. Um, so one of my one, my recommend recommendation is especially for Professor Ha. Uh, I, I'm very happy to see that you you know started you know a lot of uh, you know uh, projects you know done by ADB and other development partners. Um, so one uh, suggestion is that you may hope to maybe in future compare the uh, projects implementation because uh, quite a number of projects try to help a country to build up competency-based training system. But building system would take a long time. Very often it would take years. Uh, and when the project reaches its end, this system might just be established. So the real training and assessment activities under competency-based you know, approach would be very thin because it's near the end. Um, so I, I do encourage, you know, like our government, um, uh, you know, to, to think about, you know, like uh, uh, really touching the stones to cross river. So in this process to really integrate the uh, components and building slot, uh, blocks for training activities in parallel to building up this system. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Shinron, uh, for these uh, great suggestions. And the, I'm sorry, like uh, this is my fault, but the uh, we, we have only 10 minutes left. And the, but we, we will be happy to open up the floor. And I can see some questions already in the chat box. And the, there are some questions related to uh, Dr. Choi's presentation, for example, or like a training levy system. And also, how, how can we, you know, attract uh, Tibet students when the, you know, or, or uh, 
wage premium of the Tibet graduate is declining. And the, I can also see another question. This is both for Dr. Choi and the, Dr. Yan about the recognition of national Tibet qualification beyond national Tibet sectors. So may I ask uh, Dr. Choi and the, to, to respond first, and I will also turn over to uh, Dr. Uh, po Yang for responding the final question. In the meantime, please also feel free to put uh, your question in the chat box. This may not be answered during this webinar, but the, I may ask uh, those professors to respond uh, maybe after the webinars and the, I can possibly distribute uh, their answers to, to you. So please feel free to put uh, your excellent questions in the chat box. So first over to Dr. Choi, please. Okay, uh, regarding the uh, relative attractiveness of TV system to uh, general education, actually, uh, the wage premium of a vocational uh, high school graduate has decreased significantly, significantly, especially during the 1990s. And it has such a situation is still going on in even in these days. And as a way, as an attempt to uh, revi revitalize the attractiveness of Tibet to uses. Uh, Korean government once uh, tried to set up new kinds of vocational high schools. We call them master high schools. That is uh, not just uh, normal uh, vocational high schools. These master high schools are providing top quality vocational education with uh, field experts and highly, uh, how, how can I say it, uh, adapted or modified uh, curricula to industrial lease. And also the government promised that the graduates from these Meister High School uh, could, uh, once they enter the, uh, the labor market after the graduation, they will be able to enter universities for free. That is said, uh, with some uh, field experiences, they will be uh, granted national granted the opportunity of studying in uh, universities. But the number of uh, these, uh, to me, as I know, the number of these uh, uh, master uh, high schools is limited, just 40 or 50, but the total number of vocational high schools in Korea is more than 200 and, or 300. So now the focus, I think that the focus of vocational education in Korea is now in these days is changing. That is instead, instead of just expanding the number, increasing the number of vocational students, the focus is how to improve the quality of the vocational education or even strong uh, strengthen the linkage with higher education mm -hmm. through vocational education, uh, voc voc through the uh, ties between uh, voc vocational high school and vocational colleges, two-year or three-year colleges, and even uh, with universities. So uh, in these days, the focus is being changed. That is the answer about the uh, relative attractiveness of our Tibet, especially in these days in Korea. OK? Uh, do you want to briefly talk about this uh, recognition of national Tibet system? As well? actually, actually, uh I cannot clearly understand <laughs> the meaning of this question. Uh, okay, so this question is posed by uh, Roja Chao Jr. So can you can I yeah. can I say something? Yes, yeah, yes. I'm uh I'm Dr. Ch uh, Roger Chow Jr. I actually head the education unit, the sports division at the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, what my question is, um, in, in relation to Korea and China, uh, when you issue uh, TVET qualifications, um, have you actually undertaken um, agreements for these particular certificates or qualifications to be accepted in another country? And if so, is it uh, undertaken based on a certain industry uh, or a national level? Because uh, 
there are initiatives uh, at the ASEAN level um, looking into recognition and mapping. Um, it's one issue. And I'm actually, by the way, thank you very much for your presentation. I actually find it very interesting, uh, particularly the institutional dimensions and policy borrowing and something. Um, yeah. And I'm also talking with a Chinese colleague um, looking into how um, the Chinese experience can contribute to understanding Tibet and development uh, Tibet um, in ASEAN. So, yeah. Thank you. As far as, uh, as, far as I, uh, I know, uh, qualifications in Korea is just a national qualifications for most uh, qualifications. But uh, in these days, some occupations are requiring qualifications across the borders. So for example, IT or mechanics or... So for these uh, occupations, in these days, qualification Korean even the Korean qualifications are uh, how can I say adapting to the international how can I say the guidelines or standards, but uh, in principle, qualifications qualifications in, in Korea are just mostly national ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I just try to respond to, uh, to the question from the Chinese experiences. I think the same as the Korean case, uh, the most vocational qualifications was national. Uh, but recent years, uh, especially in the field of engineering, China was participating, for instance, the Washington Court. So for certain vocational uh, programs, especially at the social degree levels, uh, students can get this kind of international recognition if they were in specific engineering uh, field. But for the most of the vocational, especially at the secondary school level, uh, were national. Uh, but there have been recent efforts, especially for Chinese multinationals going to other Southeast Asian countries, try to bring their own uh, kind of uh, internal qualification uh, uh, standards uh, to other countries. So in this process, they also bring in some Chinese vocational uh, universities or vocational schools and bring their standards and also certificate into those countries. But I will say that was more like a bilateral level rather than really, you know, at the national recognition. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at least there are initiatives at the uh, industry level specifically because of uh, specific skill set needs uh, by enterprises. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and it's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your great questions. And the, I, I can see a lot more questions are uh, now coming in, but the uh, time is also coming up. And the, but I, I think some of the questions are already answered in the ADB publications. So so please uh, download ADB, you know, or technical study, which is available on the website. And the, the and, and I, I'm sure like you will find a lot of interesting uh, findings uh, through them. And the, also Dr. Choi and the Dr. Poyan shared uh, their email address and the, you may wish to reach out to them uh, directly if you have any burning questions. I happen to have a, a Tibet project in Bhutan. So Bhutan colleagues, you can contact me and I can <laughs> probably set up a separate meeting with Dr. Choi, Dr. Poyan and the Dr. Huawei. So you can take, take advantage of my network. <laughs> Uh, so uh, with this uh, remaining two minutes, I wanted to invite uh, Brajesh uh, for a closing remarks and the over to Brajesh. Uh, thank you, uh, Yotaro. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to everyone. It is a great pleasure to be part of this webinar. It is also great to hear from our colleagues, uh, Professor Hawe and Professor Po Yang from Peking University and to e-meet Professor Yung-Sup uh, Yung Choi from Korea University of Technology and Education. The good thing about Asia and the Pacific is uh, there are highly relevant lessons and best practices to draw on from countries that have integrated skills development in pursuing high economic growth. The rich insights from the two East Asian countries that have gone through the rapid economic transformation in the last few decades and their homegrown skills development experiences and solutions provide great examples of what kind of strategic approach is needed to make it work. Uh, my three takeaways from this webinar are the following. First, the share of Tibet is over 35% of the largest in ADB's education portfolio, but it is also the most complex subsector compared to school education and uh, higher education. 
As Professor Harvey noted, Tibet investments have had mixed results in the past. In a recent study by the Center for Global Development funded by ADB, World Bank and UK government's FCDO, while governments and uh, development partners recognize the learning crisis as a major issue when it comes to seeking support, developing countries prefer more to seek support for skills development. What the PRC and Korea have demonstrated is that if Tibet is blended well with economic development for so whole of government approach, it can be a substantial benefit at the personal company and economic economy level. But we also need to recognize that both countries have emphasized building foundational skills through universal secondary education uh, learning uh, as, as a basis for further education and training to transition to higher level skills. Second, the modality of Tibet is crucial and both demand and supply side policies matter in piloting and shaping the quality and quantity of Tibet to contextualize. When Tibet is closely linked with countries' economic growth and pathways, it proves more effective despite some of the underlying challenges we see in many developing countries. Both the PRC and Korea deliberately emphasize Tibet as a way to enhance export and domestic industries by continuously improving and enhancing the modality and relevance of Tibet programs by bringing the industry and private sector closer to training programs and vice versa. Third, we often notice that Tibet is underfinanced under-resourced, under-managed, and fragmented. The only way to change this image is by benchmarking and showing results associated with Tibet programs in terms of better employability, better earnings, better productivity, including better adaptation of new technologies, and greater joint investment by government and private sector. This is evident in the PRC and Korea as highlighted by the speaker and demonstrates how the dynamic evolution of Tibet requires strong coordination, leadership, and drive within a widely shared vision of inclusive economic growth. Once again, let me thank the speakers for sharing great insights at a time when we are talking about building back better to address the enormous learning and earning losses due to the pandemic. Let me also thank the discussants and the audience for active participation to make the discussion very lively. Finally, let me thank Ryotaro, uh, SAHS team, colleagues and the team behind this webinar for organizing an excellent, excellent session. So back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rio. Yeah, thank you very much for excellent uh, closing remarks, Rajesh. And the, I also wanted to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. I can see more than 100 people joining, and the, I hope everyone find this uh, webinar interesting. Uh, please stay safe and take care, and the, thank you once again, again for all of your participation. Thank you. Bye. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Especially many thanks to Lotaro and thanks of and Professor Harvey and Professor Poyan. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Choi, for your patience. Thank you, Lotaro. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. much. Yeah. yeah.